Hello, welcome back to theCUBE here. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We're at New York Stock Exchange, theCUBE's inaugural broadcast here on the show floor behind me. You see the stocks trading, a lot of action happening. Part of our expansion of our ecosystem into New York, Silicon Valley, New York, coming together, bringing the best content, CUBE style. Again, I'm John Furrier, your host here with Cole Crawford, who is the CEO and founder of Vapor.io, CUBE alum. Now going back to the first wave of the cloud, OpenStack, Open Compute, one of the original pioneers in cloud computing, at it again, Cole, great to see you. Thanks for joining me here in theCUBE at our inaugural New York Stock Exchange just solo broadcast. I'm super thrilled to be here. Yeah, exciting to have you on. As you know, uh, NYSE partnership uh, with the Wired community. Uh, they do a great job getting all those interviews, Trinity and the team. Um, but we're going deeper dives here at the New York Star format, as you know. Um, explain a little bit about, so for context, just to zoom out, um, what you're doing with Vapor, how you got here, set up the table, what's the origination story, how'd you get here, what got you to this point, and what do you guys do? Man, great question. So, I mean, look, you were you were there at the beginning of OpenStack, you were there at the beginning of Open Compute. you covered both of those massive transformative shifts in the industry. I happen to be lucky enough to be a part of both of those things and run those things. Um, Part of that, of course, when you're the executive director of a of a nonprofit like Open Compute, you, you see some see some roadmaps. <laughs> Look at some roadmaps, and yeah. you know you don't have to be Einstein to say, "Gee, is like, uh, you know, some of the some of the things they're talking about need slower latency than what that what we've got today." Um, and having been an engineer for most of my career, yeah. you know, started my career in the '90s at US West, so telco yeah. network guy. Um, it seemed pretty obvious to me that there was a there was a gap that needed to be filled. You know, the thing about open compute, and again, I want not to remember this, but I want to get into what you do with Vapor, so I think what you got going on is super compelling. It is kind of a game shaping moment, like the cloud, like um, with open compute. Mark Zuckerberg was recently quoted, he gave a talk with uh, another Facebook alum who went on to do other things. Um, and you know, Zuck's in his 40s now, he's got a family, he's not the kid in Harvard anymore. He was talking about, you know, how they made it. Social networking is around, you had friends to before at MySpace. It was not really that, it was pretty obvious it was there, but it was, it was poo pooed. Ah, it's just a college kid's thing. Oh, they'll never make any money. They start making, oh, they'll do the transition to mobile. And they beat it, but they got the scale up. But one of the things Zuckerberg actually called out in that interview was the fact that open compute was a key part of their success. At the same time, a guy named Satya Nadella, who is now the CEO of Microsoft, was just some little division head at Microsoft running infrastructure. So open compute has been identified as probably one of the most important inflection points not covered, so broadly in tech. And I'll, I'll bring it up, I want to get your thoughts. I think this is worth talking about because it's going to connect the dots to Vapor. At that time, Facebook couldn't hire engineers. Microsoft was nowhere, Our stock was like 26. If you bought stock at that time, you would have been a zillionaire. Satya Nadella had the vision to open source their infrastructure. Facebook donated all their infrastructure IP. This is intellectual property. This was the first open sourcing of IP, intellectual property, around hyperscale technology. Look, okay, at that time, Andy Besserstein was there. Yep. Obviously, the Rembrandt of motherboards, as Pat Gelsinger calls them. This was a seminal moment, and that shifted as cloud then took off. You had all this IP in there. That essentially created Azure. Facebook was launched. They got more community, and now Llama is exploding as the lingua franca for developers for coding, and that's getting smaller, faster, cheaper. It's free, it's open source, but it's going to run on devices, inference. So AI is clearly coming from that growth. Yep. And this is kind of where we are. Okay, fast forward to the enterprise market. They're kind of stuck in yesterday's boomer version of databases. Um, antiquated, inadequate data modeling, and certainly old school data center infrastructure that's been going to the cloud, but now we have a renaissance in supercomputing that's democratized for the masses, low latency networks, highly connected. Yep. Kind of, this is the current situation. What's your color commentary, and then we'll get into how those dots connect for Vapor. Well, first and foremost, I, I, I'm glad that Zuck recognizes that open compute was a big part of the strategy, and actually it's funny, as I was being recruited by Frank Fikoski, who reported to Jay who reported to, to, to Mark, um, I remember Frank saying, hey, like you're the most prolific open source guy we know. You just done, you know, you just did OpenStack. Okay. Like you, you were the cloud advisor that I was, the founding cloud advisor of the Linux Foundation. I've built lots of clouds. I was working on the Linux kernel in, in the early 2000s. 
Um, so I've been an open source guy for a long time, and I, I, I believe in the democratization of data. Uh, now with Vapor, I believe in the democratization of the network as well, and I think you and I really see eye to eye on the, the, the power of that kind of data flow. Right? And the intelligent apps are coming. I mean, if you look at, I mean, we've commented on this on, on theCUBE many times, you have the frenzy of Gen AI now, almost two years into the hype cycle, yep. but it's real. It's category, it's a new category. Jensen Wong said that at GTC. Yep. I believe it to be true because it's generating things. Yep. It's not like some pre-programmed database. It's like prompt response, yep. and that's why we see different responses. Okay, there is a huge appetite for developers right now on Gen AI. Infrastructure is lagging. So there's a lot of retooling going on. And what's waiting in the wings is the data layer that's going to get flipped upside down that's right. to be horizontally scalable because if I got a phone or a device or an IoT device, a camera, street camera, I got to have high speed and data, low latency, and I got to have software and compute power. I mean, you can't put an NVIDIA GPU into a camera on the street. Right. So the network now becomes the most important piece of the equation because computes rocking and rolling, GPUs, TPUs, and then all the new systems being built. So this is kind of where Vapor comes in. One, you agree with what I'm saying, and if you, if so, what happens next? Yeah, well, well clearly we agree. Um, and uh, every every developer I know today, all these young, you know, young kids. Uh, you know, I started this company when I was a young man. <laughs> uh, um, but all these kids today want to write to an abstraction layer. Behind that abstraction layer, behind that API, behind whatever that that library is, there's hardware. There's, there's a machine that is doing something. The same is true for the network, right? We all walk around on our cell phones today thinking, hey, this whole world's wireless now. Nope, it takes wires off for wireless. There's a lot of fiber optics <laughs> behind that wireless it's network. It's called backhaul. It's called backhaul. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of capital behind all of that. So the question for all these enterprises that are, you know, behind, I would say the adoption curve of an yeah. enterprise is several years behind cloud. The good news is cloud has recognized the value of like distributed compute and inferencing and the, the conversion of training to tuning to deployment and you know how you actually monetize that, which of course is inferencing. Enterprises are now like based on uh, based on a number of factors, both you know where, where we are in our um, uh, our journey with um, you know revenue and 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 to, you know total contract value as well as the conversations that we're now having with enterprises, it's clear to me that there is a real need for the type of infrastructure cloud that, that we operate. And it's not that the, the, and I certainly don't mean to imply that hyperscale clouds today are also operating at like legacy yeah. sort of mindset and architecture, but sort of. I mean, they, they, they built what they built, they built where it was built, and the reality, Vapor is a 10 year old company now because it takes 10 years to build this type of footprint. If you want to be in downtown Austin, you, you explain Vapor's uh, business and how you guys, what assets you have in play, what's the what's the network topology look like, why does it exist, what's the main value proposition? So we talked about backhaul. The 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 Vapor was meant to design uh, solutions for enterprises that need a lot of localized backbone. So not a backbone that is like a national scale. We operate that, and that's valuable. Yeah. But if you also need a backbone in New York, if you need a backbone in Atlanta, or any one of the other hundred and 10 locations that make up 36 markets of deployable you know, market um, infrastructure, we built local backbones before we built national backbones. And that was very much a, a strategic thing because you know, if you are a, a street camera or you're operating a street camera and you do need a low latency computer vision application, that's like the latency threshold for like how to get the response time down to something that is useful yeah. for that use case, you're not going to get that a centralized cloud. So there's a couple use cases that are emerging that we see on the radar. I want to get your thoughts on how Vapor fits in. One is the idea of edge nodes, devices. We all have phones, yep. cars now are there. Yep. So that's one, so that's a big trend. We all kind of get that phone device data to the, to the device. So that's one, pretty obvious. Two other non-obvious use cases is notion of sovereignty, localization of data, yep. whether that's some sort of regulation, restriction, understanding how to manage data within proximities for everything from privacy to intellectual property. You know, Tesla runs data in the car. We all know what a Tesla does, so we see that. And then third is this idea that, um, you know, AI governance, okay, is going to be a big deal, right? So you say AI, AI sovereignty, AI regulation, explainability, and data as intellectual property. So you got edge, you have this notion of, of sovereignty, localization, and then you have now kind of 
this kind of other, I won't say soft issue, but like, you know, where's the data come no, from? The, yeah. It's my intellectual property. I don't want to be in the public. These now are causing a little bit of disruption and companies are coming out of the woodwork because the applications need to know this. Correct. And the users shouldn't have to know anything. 1,000%. So the network drives all the behavior. Connect the dots. Yeah, and it, I, actually I can roll all of that into kind of one one answer too, which is, I mean, it's it's profound that, like, that you know how to ans ask the question in that way. Um, so there's no, there, as far as the internet is concerned, there's no edge of the internet. There's just more internet and there's more devices in a specific place that need governance. Right, and, and that governance, especially when you move to an application like AI, now is the data that was input for the training, was it ethically trained? Like how was it trained? Where can it be deployed? What's the use case? Because the reality is back to that street lamp or that, that, that light, doesn't need to know French poetry. Doesn't need to do any sort of you know, translation into another, another language. It just needs to know what a stop sign is. It needs to know what a pedestrian is. And it needs to be there and present and local and the requirements from cities and states and nations. You know, Jensen talks a lot about sovereign cloud. Yeah. That sovereign cloud could be a military grade sort of national defense focused cloud, but it could also be a kind of a mundane transportation related sovereign cloud where the data doesn't leave, say Clark County in Las Vegas. It could be that. And then the question is, the, the, the applications and the technical requirements that go into how this gets deployed at scale, especially in an AI world, <laughs> how this is deployed at scale, the network is the computer. Yeah, it's interesting when you talk, is it, first of all, <laughs> it's more complex because those no, these new dimensions create more complexity. Yeah. In every single market transition, when there's product transition and product-led growth, which we're in right now, the best product-led growth strategies win in the market transition. So what happens is complexity is abstracted away. That's always the winning formula. Reduce the steps it takes to do something, make it faster, and make it easier to use. I mean, that is just generic. I didn't even mention the company. Okay, so I have to ask you, this is happening right now. Why can't the cloud guys do this? What is the what is the gap? Because they got the lift and shift business. They certainly, if you want to do data processing, Amazon's great. Yep. Uh, there's so many great things that AWS is great yep. for, as is Azure. They got open AL, some people say that's kind of sliding away, but but cloud's gonna, not going anywhere, but Correct. why can't they do what Vapor's doing? What's the gap? Well, it's not that they can't do what we're doing. It's just going to take them 10 years to get to where we started 10 years ago. Because the reality is, if you want to put up a data center in Austin, Texas, it's going to, you know, you, and actually Google's a good example of this because they learned this with Google Fiber. You know, remember when Google Fiber was going to be everywhere in like a couple of years yes. and they're still building and it takes, it just takes time to do these things. So there's a, there's a running joke, uh, personally lo love the state, have nothing against it, but there's a running joke in digital infrastructure called ABC. The acronym ABC stands for anywhere but California. <laughs> we had the zone and permit San Diego. We started that four years ago. The zoning and permitting process for San Diego, which we have a massive customer that's in like one of the data centers that we have in San Diego, it took us four years and we had to do, we had to, we had to do some pretty incredible things to actually get that infrastructure into San Diego. What well, is this, red tape? Was it, what was the issue? Oh man. Well, just it, California Just California regulations. Laws, regulations, yeah. you know, e everything in California causes cancer. You thought New York was problem. <laughs> like someone's got to get paid. Uh, I won't go there. I won't go there. I want to bring up another trend again. This would be a fourth one, but it's not that obvious. It's probably not even on anyone's radar. It's more inside baseball. Um, but you understand what the hosting market was for the folks watching. Used to host some servers in a data center. Those were called co-location facilities, colos, yep. as they call in the industry. Colos were basically facilities to host servers. Yep. And companies would use colos, and they'd run their internet web apps there. Yep. And then it became kind of like a yard so People were selling colos. Now colos become strategic network access points, right. and the rise of the role of the colo takes facilities people, and has to turn them into hyperscale systems right. designers. Right. Okay. You have all the connectivity locked down in, in your network map. What's the role of these colos? Because with AI, one of the things that's jumping out on, on, on mainstream coverage from the Cuban Silicon Angle is that companies are deploying their AI with AI, especially clouds, in controlled environments. So it looks like this colo facility, you know, the data centers of the world, like Equinix of the world, they're sitting on a gold mine. Yeah. What are they doing? So how do you, how's that one, what are they doing and how does that play into Vapor.io's plans? Great question. So. First and foremost, the reason Colo became strategic again is because the di the difference in an IT closet for an Intel box that could sit in a IT closet in a retail store might be two kW, two kilowatts, very very low power. 
the I, I, I think I will get this right. The latest Blackwell rack is about 130 kilowatts liquid cool. <laughs> Not only is there a big difference in cost, yeah. but there's a big difference in failure, right? If the cooling plant fails, yeah. what happens to that IT gear? It's yeah. not that difficult to replace uh, Intel. That's one like one little months. retail in the strip mall will take down the whole mall. The exactly. power that's sucking out of that one exactly. store. So it's a power hungry. There, it is a very power hungry business. And the Equinix of the world are, you know, these are real estate investment trusts. These are re these are real estate companies at the end of the day. You know, th that's really kind of what sets Baber apart a little bit. We, we operate the real estate, but we built this all cloud down, not brick and mortar up. It's the same thing. We have the same hyperscale like data centers. Yeah. What the advantage that an Equinix or a digital or any of these big players have is economies of scale. Yeah. You build a million square foot data center, like the raw materials comes down. Well, we have to do this in bite-sized chunks. So then the question is, how do you offer, at the end of the day, to your point around economic, yeah. the, the killer app for any industry, any yeah. anything is economics and easy button. Make it faster, better, cheaper. Uh, yeah, a, so, that's so, so so you can't, Dave Bilant and I have an expression, Dave's the co-host of theCUBE, if you're watching, first time here in the New York Stock Exchange, we have an old expression, you can't make a fish climb a tree, okay? When you're talking about real estate trusts, they're not sitting there going, I want to get the low, maybe my higher manager, but only when you Correct. have the totality of that market, Correct. sitting there as Correct. diamond in the rough, Correct. you've got to look at that and say, damn, clearly, because this we, is a great opportunity. What's going to go on? You see them, those fish, can they climb that tree or do you come in and others will arbitrage? Because those things are major pieces on the chessboard when you look at the future of chain of AI because supercomputing is coming. These become supercomputing centers. These are major utility points of presence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, they're, clearly they're going to play a, a, a big role for a long time. The question is, how strategic are they? And this is an open question. How strategic are they when you need that low latency experience? And, and if you think about where these large real estate trusts are deploying big data centers, it's about 12 U.S. markets. Right? That doesn't solve for Austin, Texas. That doesn't solve for Cincinnati. That doesn't solve yeah. for Pittsburgh. Like there's a bunch of markets that... If you're if you're a big retail enterprise or transportation company or computer vision company, if you want US scale and you want the same ubiquitous experience for that low latency application, you can't deploy it in those facilities because you don't have that latency profile yeah. that, that I can give you. I just saw your presentation. I did a flyby because I was doing some interviews here earlier today uh, on our big our first day at the NYSC. I did catch your network map, which I knew, but I loved your use case example, and I want to go there for a second, because I think this really highlights some of the things you've been working on, and you maybe could add some color commentary to it. Uh, one is, you're all over the US, highly tight connections, you own them, optical, high speed, you know, fiber, you know, all lit up beautifully, low latency, super yep. fast. You're pushing the laws of physics to the, to the max, got that, great. But the use cases are like hospitals, healthcare, these verticals. Now to roll back when we were growing up, you'd had a LAN and you hang some PCs on them. Those were connections. Your PC was connected to a LAN. We all can relate to that. Yeah. Everyone watching there, you know, I had a PC was connected to the network. Yeah. Oh, my laptop at home is connected to my Wi-Fi. But when you're in these markets, you're talking about thousands of devices. If you're a hospital, you're running thousands of devices. You have patients, you have all kinds of diverse things going on. And you know we we call it the Uber of the enterprise, where Uber has drivers, people, places, and things. You got all kinds of diverse, heterogeneous platforms that have to come together. Generative AI is going to stitch this together. Yep. We've talked to experts about this. This is the challenge that people are dealing with. Scope this opportunity both from a problem solution perspective, because now you got potentially hundreds of thousands of devices, some coming online, offline, terminating connections, a lot of data flying around. I mean, just massive stuff happening. Yep. Scope the problem opportunity, and, and how does that connect to your use cases? Sure, uh, you mentioned healthcare, so we'll take that as an example. Yeah. So we're, we're, and we're actually building the, 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 the 5G network in Vegas for the medical district, so a lot of the economic development for the hospitals and cancer treatment centers and research uh, centers that are coming into town, they're, they're going to have access to this network. And why is that powerful? That's powerful because if you're, and I'm just going to use an example, like 23andMe, yeah. right? You're getting a bunch of genomic data from a bunch of people. Now, you've got this data set, but you've got this data set that is pretty static. Like, your genome doesn't really change. I mean, it, yeah. it can, things can, <laughs> it's like, I hope mine changes. Let's, let's not go into the, the, the well, yeah. I don't want to get Alzheimer's. Come on, let's get that cure going. So this is my point. So you could have a, you could have a, a, a certain protein or you could have a, you know, certain allele, it's called an allele, that 
it, it puts you at a higher risk for a neurodegenerative disease. Now, take, take in the real-time stuff, take in the epigenetic data, take in the, the air you're breathing and the environment that you're in. The only way an AI model is actually gonna know how to solve this across all of the things that can be context. I mean, the reality for genomic sequences, sequencing is, we know a lot about the gene, we know a lot about what it's supposed to do, but we don't actually know what outside influences can affect that gene. Like we still have no real idea why you get Parkinson's or why you get Alzheimer's. We know, we know the symptoms, we don't know the causes. If you wanna solve this, you need to solve this in the real world where the air we're breathing and the food that we're eating. I mean, it's, I could go, I could talk- You need about data, that. you need data and horsepower. Horsepower and data and time. And that, and, but then that time is like twofold, right? You need the time to do the research. And there's, there's really interesting studies where they've done mouse models where exact in like these, these um, bee, I forget, bee something mouse, like it's, they're yeah. inbred, they're highly inbred mice. They're the, what you kind of run terrible for drug discovery, but that's kind of what we do today. I don't know why. Um, some of these mice, we just shipped around the U S and they'll, they'll like be looking at a certain drug. So a, a mouse in Seattle will live twice as long as a mouse in Florida. We don't know why. It's the moisture. The, the, it, could be, a lot. It, could, it could be the humidity. <laughs> Absolutely, it could be the humidity. We don't. But we. The point is now. But you can crunch the numbers now. You can do things now with super Correct. computing you couldn't do before. That's a thousand percent. And so now you add a Gen AI layer on top of this. Remember, yeah. AI everything needs to be centrally trained. But centrally doesn't need to be. Yeah. That central doesn't need to be in the same physical location. Central can be a centralized logical network where. That, that that lab in Seattle is attached to the lab in Florida and you have a high speed interconnect yeah. for those two labs to be communicating in real time with lots of AI enabled data. That's, this is what Vapor built. We had uh, here on theCUBE on our first day, Renan, the CEO, co-founder of Vast Data. Um, and we were talking about how horizontal scalability has to come to data. Cloud basically made horizontal scale work. Yep. And vertical specialism with the application yep. called, SAS, called SaaS. Yep. So, um, I didn't ask him this question, but I'll ask you later, but we can ponder on it. If web app was, predecess was the predecessor to SaaS, what is SaaS the predecessor of? What kind of apps are we going to see next? Because SaaS was simple. Dropbox, I want to store files in the cloud. Yeah. We used to do that with FTP client. Yeah. Okay, just put a user interface on yeah. it. That's a SaaS app. Yeah. What's the, what's the next upgrade? Reactive. What kind of apps? Reactive. What we were seeing, explain. Reactive. So if you are a consumer with a certain profile and you're, you know, you, you're, 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 lots of advertisers know who you are based on what you do on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever. They're listening to us now, I'll get ads about uh, vast data. When, when I come out, like <laughs> I just mentioned vast data, there it is. <laughs> so lots of people know, right? But let's say that you opt in for certain experiences. Now you could be walking down the street and you say, I have a, I have a preference for yogurt. So you'd be walking down the street and all of a sudden a, uh, a retailer could say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, I don't know, um, what's that? the best yogurt on sale right now? Or come, some come point of purchase? Come by for a 10% discount. So some sort of point of purchase. So, so first, hyper-personalization. Hyper-personalization, but reactive also. It doesn't need to be personalized. It could be, yeah. be self-healing applications, right? Hey, my, the data center I'm living in is down. The latency threshold for the for myself is X. What other infrastructure is available for yeah. me to move? To? I think I think uh, I asked the question to Amazon CEO Matt Garman. I just interviewed him last Friday to come out this week. I asked him. I said, you know, what will those apps on? And I said scaled apps because we we couldn't solve some of the biology problems we had before because every inflection point allows entrepreneurs to solve hard problems. Yep. So what's the hard problems? It all comes back down to data. This is what Ren and I were talking about in Vast Data. So if you have data available and you get Vapor IO, your architecture, where it's fast edge, you can go core to edge in, in milliseconds or co-locate data where you need to. So you're not moving a lot of data around. Yeah. So you got high availability and highly available data. Yep. Okay, great, check. That's well, that's known constructs and, and network computing uh, 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 concepts. The, what I asked him was, where's the apps? And he says, no, we're enabling that. The word abstraction layer between the physical layer storage and feed the compute and all work together. So I want to ask you, do you think Vast Data has got the right approach? I know you've done some work with them. Yep. I saw something on your website, on oh, Vast's website, you're partnering with Vast. Why are they relevant to you and what's their prospects? How would you explain 
what they're thinking because they're a little bit different. They don't look like every other vendor. Out there. No, they don't. And actually, we we fill one of the economic gaps that might exist. You know, they're they're the type of company that you buy your hardware, they give you the license, you operate based on the size of you know the the, the storage footprint that you want to deploy. If you want that all as a service with the hardware included, Vapor can give you that. So we can we can provide the the, the hard drives and the the motherboards and the CPUs, the memory, the disk, and and that license all kind of as a service per month. So the cloud the cloud model for this. But more importantly, I think what's and we're similar in that you know we are also an enabler. Like I I don't know what the killer app for 5G is. I just know that whatever that killer app is, it's probably gonna run on my network. It's just making it go as fast as possible. <laughs> the Apple will show itself. Correct. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, like humans are bad at predicting the future. Like <laughs> we, I was at South by the year that Twitter was launched. And it launched at South by yeah. Southwest in Austin, Texas, yeah. and I was like, I was there too. And you know what the use case of that was? Where's the party? Where's the party? All about communication. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah. All right. So, um, Cole, great to see you first of all, and congratulations. Um, I've gotten to know you over the years, over a decade and a half, um, and the work you did has been phenomenal. I mean, again, we'll do a separate throwback uh, section because I think it's worth talking about the people that were involved in those early pioneer days of, of cloud and certainly open compute and, and beyond. I want to ask you. You tend you tend to be early on things. Uh, you probably know that it's not. It's a it's, it's, it's as much a curse as is a yeah, blessing. It could, yeah. yeah. Once you know it, that you have that problem or gift, <laughs> the thing how you look at it, um, you got to kind of slow down and let the future catch up. Uh, so as a visionary, okay, when you look at Vapor, ten years, did, what is the most important thing people should know about Vapor? What are you guys working on? What's the core thesis? Why Vapor? Why you went after this? Um, what itch were you scratching? Why did you go down this road? We, I, I, so it goes back to your other question about you know what what what's industry breaking or unlocking for any company that's trying to hard, solve a hard problem. We wanted to take the complexity and insert the economics, you know, the opex economics of cloud at scale. Where at scale isn't just about lots of GPUs; it's about lots of real estate and the distributed footprint of what that cloud was going to be able to do for you. It's a different, it really is a, it's an internet. I mean, we, we set out to re-architect the internet. It was a big, yeah. bold vision. Cool. It, telcos, as you know, telcos and clouds both operate central out. We think that that, yeah. we think the reverse should be true. Yeah, tactical edge and military, user experience at the edge, has to be hyper-personalized, real time. Clearly you're on the right track. Um, what are you up to now? Give, a, give us a quick taste of things you're working on, uh, how big is the company? Are you hiring? Are you doing financing? What's the what's the state of the union? Give us the update on Vapor.io. What, what's going on? Well, I just um, I don't want to give too much away here, but um, <laughs> I, I just received a non-binding term sheet for a very large uh, pipe assigned to me uh, yesterday. Um, so be on the All right, breaking news. We we might be able. Here to... we go on the cube here in NYSE. Money is involved too. So pipe public. We'll see. All right. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I guess you're on the big board. I know it's, it's, it could be very serendipitous. So we're sitting. I'm going to get the commission. We get this going on this. <laughs> um, but um, you know, we're doing big things. Uh, we have a big announcement coming up um, at Mobile World Congress in October, yeah. uh, Las Vegas. Um, it has to do with uh, what's called AI RAM, so artificial yeah. intelligence combined with the radio access network on the yeah. telco side. Um, that's super compelling. Very recently, we. Um, we signed up to do a... And the uh, theory there is tightly coupled radio interface to wire, right? Or if you want to run the radio access network on the exact same hardware that can also run your inferencing models and on potentially VAST or someone like VAST, global namespace, so you've got training, tuning, inferencing, and then retraining all on one fabric, one very performant fabric, that's that's the ticket. And, the, and without it, what happens? Just as a disconnect between inference crossing kind of platforms or, or connectivity layers? What is the problem that's solved there? You just you just insert a lot of, first off, you, you insert a lot more cost into the backhaul, right? and you insert the latency that comes with having to get that data centrally trained back inside of that central data center and then pushed back out, so it's transit both ways. Um, and it's, Wire speed. Uh, and, 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 and wire speed is, you know, once you're putting data through it, yeah. you've got TCP IP, there's a bunch of technical things that go into it. Like yeah, it doesn't yeah. just all get shipped at the speed of light. Um, so there's, there's, and, and so your focus now with the pipe is what acquisitions, bringing more technology in. Can you, we'll uh, see, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I'm going to save that one. Okay. But, uh, final questions. 
you're early. You might be early. What do you, now that you have experience, what are you patient for and what do you aren't patient I'd for? I'd say we were early. I'd say, when, I mean, we, we started Vapor in 2015. We were damn near too early in 2015. We're on time now. Uh, the reality is, if you look at what Jensen said at GTC just a few months ago, 40%, this happened in the earnings call right after GTC, 40% of the revenue is now on inferencing. Yeah. This is, there's a reason why, if you remember the, um, the ARM acquisition was yep. a big, was a big Huge. deal. Grace Hopper is, you know, part ARM. It, fantastic CPU architecture for inferencing. Yeah. Um, I don't have any inside baseball on this, but my guess is <laughs> on the next earnings call, you're going to see inferencing taking up a lot more. Yeah. So we had, we, Dave and I had uh, one-on-ones with Jensen and all the Broadcom execs on the chip side. So inference is the killer app that's well understood. Reinforced learning yep. is coming back on the other over the top. Yep. So that's next. So it's like, you know, go to school, get trained, yep. make inferences and get some reinforced learning. Yep. Study up, learn new things, and then that's the totality of the package. That flywheel kicks in. Yep. But the other wild card, and quick, quick thoughts on this, is that the silicon roles are changing. Okay, you have custom silicon, faster cycle times to get out the smaller nanometer, number one. Number two, chips around chips. Packaging of XPUs or CPU with GPUs, smaller devices at the edge could have great compute, which by the way, inference works great with compute too. You don't need just GPUs, right. but they won't go away, but right. compute can fill the void for the smaller models. Yep. So that's the semiconductors is happening. But the big thing, again, no one's reporting this. I want to get your thoughts on this because it's, it's happening. More, there's an ISV software ecosystem developing above the classic semiconductor developers where classic software guys yep. and gals are coding to the kernel machine layer. Yep. This is real. All the best AI apps out there, like the perplexities of the world, are coding to the kernels. This is happening. Does that Do you agree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And why? And, well, and it's it, actually, it's it's the challenge is even harder than just the kernel because uh, you go to one vendor and you can deploy GPUs on, say, Ubuntu. For another vendor, it that reference architecture only works on Red Hat, as an example. In addition to that, you now have inputs and outputs at the network layer. So, like, what what networking, am I talking at layer three? Am I talking at layer two? <laughs> there, so where this is all headed, and I think yeah. that, you know, Vapor's got a massive head start here. Yeah. We talked about reactive applications. Imagine how to be a workload for any number of industries. We don't have to pick it. It could be any of them where you've got some TPU, some GPU, some CPU, some ASIC, some FPGA, and you're using Gen AI to say, I need this app to do this, 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 and this, right? And I want it to cost me this or within this economic profile. Architect it in such a way that the right code is running on the right silicon yeah. at the right time. Yeah, it's funny. It's uh, Dave and I always talk about this, and then I'll, I'll say that here because we are broadcasting our inaugural NYSE, the money to be made in this wave is going to come from developers that were not yesteryear. So SaaS was, how do I stand up apps on the cloud? That's, right. That's quick programming, get up That's in right. the cloud, provision it, iterate quickly, be agile, fail fast, that kind of, that kind of m mindset to assassin level ninjas that can just you know, Navy SEALs that can come down and be coding at the kernel level. And I'm going to tell you, that's not state of the art in the sweet spot of, of the developer community. It's like classic computer science, but the money to be made will be there. 100%. If you're in this market looking for the next billion dollar unicorn or decacorn, look for the kernel developers. And if I'm a developer sitting there saying, I can learn machine learning, I can get down to kernel level, because that's where the money's going to be made. That's where the next breakout will be. I think that's right. I mean, that combined with anybody that actually knows how to program for, you know, in the past we called this parallel computing, has kind of evolved into distributed computing. But at the kernel level, as soon as we're, you know, most applications, I'm getting super technical here uh, with you for a second, John, but there's so many applications are still single threaded. When you can get to multi-threaded at scale, when we can figure that out, yes. the, this, this, the, our whole world yeah. looks entirely different. And I think that's, the, that's going to be the generational shift that's going to separate this next gen. It's interesting. Someone said, I don't get all this talk. Are you speaking Russian to me about this kernel stuff? Watch the CrowdStrike uh, Microsoft relationship when CrowdStrike so-called had that disruption. But really, Microsoft was really the problem because they were doing kernel-level access to the machines so to upgrade 
They were doing their job. CrowdStrike was just doing their job. Now, bad hygiene, okay, but Microsoft. Well, as the guy you know, called, no, we're going to okay. bring this full circle. Okay. And as the guy right. called Microsoft at Open Compute to, to bring them in, under yeah. the umbrella, I'm yeah. not going to say how, who I think is yeah. to blame for that, but I, but I will say that what Open Compute did for Microsoft because remember, Microsoft had a, a pretty bad reputation for open source as well. Yeah. Facebook didn't, people didn't Under know. Under Balmer, they were like .NET only. 100%. Um, what Open Compute did for both of those companies and others as well, yeah. through the democratization and through the yeah. open source, you know, the open sourcing of hardware, they built community. They built a big community yeah. of knowledge. We're doing the exact same thing yeah. here. To be fair on Microsoft, although I brought them up, I will say there's two Microsofts in my mind. There's the post Balmer Microsoft under Satya Nadella, yeah. who led, who was yeah. the leader, yeah. who took the bold bet for the open compute and shout out to Microsoft. And by the way, since then, highly active in CNCF, KubeCon, and CloudNativeCon. Awesome work there, great people over there. It's the Windows platform. Again, back to what was old and antiquated, yeah. Linux, you know, much hardened, much more hardened OS. So I think that's just highlights to me that the businesses have not yet gotten off of because you know, sometimes the best approach is say, ah, you know, it's, it's working. It's not broke, don't fix, don't, don't fix it. Well, yep. guess what? When you're in a connected network like cloud computing, the, the cascade effect of that disruption was innocent bad behavior by CrowdStrike on the QA side turned into a chain reaction that just, you know, and Delta was the, well, the one of the worst who could, couldn't get like, recovered. No, that's right. And I mean, look, this is this is a little bit of what Vapor set out to build. If there was a if there was a better way of doing that over the, the public internet, we would use private backbones for this. And Microsoft runs a big yeah. private backbone, but CrowdStrike has a bunch of customers that are not on Microsoft's yeah. owner-operated <laughs> backbone. But when you can solve that, yeah. you can stage your rollouts. Yeah. We yeah. could have avoided this. Yeah. This totally. was totally avoidable. It was totally avoidable. And by the way, that everyone's auto update. Cole, great to see you. Um, are you shocked by the industry the way it is? Are you not shocked? Are you surprised? Are you excited about this market right now? I mean, do you feel like this is one of the most exciting times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Times? I, mean, I really have. Because, you know, the, there is a, in, in IT, we talk about the pendulum of IT. We talk about distributed, centralized. Right now, AI is largely centralized, yeah. right? We've got big data centers, 500, you know, 500 billion parameter LLMs that we're training with, you know, gigawatts of power. Um, that'll that'll yeah. shift back out to being distributed. Vapor's, uh, I think, uh, accelerating a lot of that. But also just an infrastructure. Yeah. It seems to me that the the sort of fun the the fun times and the yeah. you know the transformative times shifts from like infrastructure to social, et cetera. And we're very much in the infrastructure. Well, it's great to have you on. And again, you're a leader in the industry. Again, props to you. Great to see you again. Thanks for coming on the Thanks Cube, our Narble Cube. I'm John Furrier here in New York City, the New York Stock Exchange, all day wall-to-wall -wall coverage here on technology coming to Silicon Valley to Silicon Valley to NYSC. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.